Hey guys, this is Tho Bishop, and on this week on Radio Rothbard, we wanted to share a new podcast offering, War, Economy, and State. Now, this is going to be a monthly foreign policy-focused podcast, starring not only Ryan McMakin, but also Zach Yost, who you've heard on a few episodes of Radio Rothbard. If you enjoy our product here on this show, I think you'll enjoy the interesting look at international relations and political science from a Rothbardian perspective. I want to thank all of you for listening to this show and the variety of podcasts that the Mises Institute puts out. The traffic has been great, and that's why we want to try to broaden your experiences and the topics that we cover. So please enjoy the inaugural episode of War, Economy, and State. Hello, and welcome to the War, Economy, and State podcast. This is a new podcast here from the Mises Institute. I'm Ryan McMakin. I'm a senior editor with the Mises Institute. And joining me today and who will be my regular co-host is Zachary Yost. And I know Zachary from Mises University and from the Mises Institute. He's done policy work on foreign policy in Washington and is recently a 2021 uh, Marcellus Policy Fellow at the John Quincy Adams Society. And so we'll just be getting here together uh, for this podcast uh, about every month to discuss geopolitical issues. So these involve war, uh, foreign policy in general, the State Department, but also things like immigration, free trade, maybe even things like water and resource usage and the importance of the location of mountain ranges and anything that might really be relevant to how states view their local environment and how they would seek to maximize power. So we'll be discussing a lot about the state, the nature of the state, and how this relates to states' view of themselves in relation to other states and their borders and the people in other states and their own states. So this is uh, not uh, not really going to focus on domestic policy at all, except as how it relates to geopolitical issues. And uh, so that's just uh, to give you an idea of what this new podcast is all about. And so, Zach, thanks for joining me today. Thanks so much for having me on. I'm pretty excited. I think we're going to learn a lot and talk a lot about interesting things over our episodes. Well, and I thought we would just start out with a fairly easy topic, that being NATO, which these days is in the news a lot because Sweden and Finland have said they want to join NATO. And this has a real fun wrinkle in it because uh, Turkey uh, has announced it is opposed to it. And just to set up the issue then, We've got NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. That's basically a um, a common defense league of sorts that's existed since 1949. Uh, but what a lot of people don't know about it um, is that it doesn't include all European countries or even all Western European countries. There have long been parts of Europe that have declared themselves to be neutral. And this includes Austria, of course, Switzerland, but also Sweden and Finland. And it includes some countries that you wouldn't expect to be part of what is often generally seen as a European group, uh, which specifically is Turkey. And so this has been a source of some conflict over the years, but it hasn't really been anything critically uh, problematic. Uh, but now that Sweden and Finland, in response to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, have said they want to join NATO, and Turkey is, has said, uh, no, we're going to veto that because members have a veto. It has to apparently be unanimous for uh, approval of new members, and uh, Turkey's opposed. And this uh, this is very interesting. I did not see this coming, uh, and Zach, so... <laughs> Why don't you tell us a little bit about the demands Turkey's making? I mean, what what does this mean? Is this likely to make any real difference? Will Sweden and Finland really be kept out? Or is this just a negotiating tactic? Is Does this spell trouble for the future of NATO? What do you think? Yeah, so I also was not expecting Turkey to object. Um, and ultimately, I don't think they'll really hold things up in the end. I think it's just... Uh, 
a tactic to basically get a, a bribe <laughs> from potentially uh, other NATO members, but also Finland and Sweden. Specifically, uh, Erdogan's gripes are, one, both countries um, have sanctioned Turkey um, because of things related to the Syrian civil war, I believe. And also, both countries uh, are sort of have people who are friendly to, I believe it's called the PKK, which is this Kurdish uh, political group that Turkey considers terrorists and also blames that coup that happened a few years ago on. So it, I'm not really sure what to expect. Um, Erdogan flat out said, like, don't bother trying to come here to convince us to let you in. But I suspect that's just a negotiating tactic. Uh, on the other hand, it is kind of hard to imagine Sweden extraditing Kurds <laughs> to, you know, be tortured in a Turkish prison somewhere. Um, but something I suspect will be worked out eventually. But what exactly? I'm not sure. Well, another thing I saw suggested about what Turkey should maybe negotiate about is full membership in the EU. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> if you've been around a while, you might remember yeah. that, I don't know, maybe it was 10 years ago that Turkey was really making and putting on a press to get uh, into the EU as a full member. And I think back then even the Pope came out against it. And a lot of these <laughs> Europeans are like, look, Turkey is not really a European <laughs> country. The EU is really sort of a Christian civilization thing. Some people were just outright saying that. And Turkey was like, fine, if, whatever. Uh, you don't want to, you don't, you don't want us in EU. Well, we, we don't like you either. And so that was a source of, of some problems. And now think about adding insult to injury, right? You got Turkey, which is a pretty big, important country. And you've got at the same time, EU is now saying, oh, we should get you, we should fast track Ukrainian. Uh -huh. <laughs> membership in the EU. And Ukraine is the backwater of backwaters, right? It has a very, contrary to what the Russians and the American uh, regimes think, I do not think Ukraine holds the key to geopolitical power in the world. Um, but it's, well, it's not nothing. But this idea that this really dirt poor country that has a GDP half the size of Russians' GDP per capita uh, should be fast-tracked into the EU is quite remarkable from, I think, the standpoint of Turkey, if you're sitting there looking at this, given the importance of a country, of a, of a city like Istanbul uh, to Europe overall. Uh, so again, just another big insult to the Turks. And I mean, so yes, I there, there's involved. also <laughs> this talk of fast-tracking Moldova as well, which is, I think, the poorest <laughs> state in, in Europe. <laughs> backwater uh, so. of a backwater of a backwater. I mean, that's yeah. a, yeah, the, <laughs> suddenly we're at, well, yeah, <laughs> uh, Joseph Solis Mullen, who writes uh, articles for Mises.org, that's M-I-S-E-S dot -E org, by the way, if you're listening and would like to get more content similar to what you're hearing right now. But uh, Joseph, uh, who writes a lot of foreign policy, uh, we were joking around and saying that it won't be long before we start to he see articles in the Washington Post about how important it is to protect the democracy democracy in Moldova and in Transnistria <laughs> and how these places are key partners in uh, Western uh, defense. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's suddenly these places that nobody ever heard of six months ago are, are absolutely central to the discussion in Washington. And so I think Turkey looks at that and uh, <laughs> and they they think, what, what a joke, right? I mean, really, and I was, as, as I mentioned earlier, I, I, just to make sure I wasn't throwing out bad dates, I went back and checked when Turkey joined NATO. And it was way back in 1952, with the first initial, I think, 12 members joining in 1949. And then you had uh, some members join soon after that in the early 50s. And Turkey was among those. And that was really quite a coup, I would think, for for NATO, right? Because really, if you get Turkey in there, you're really constraining the Soviets in uh, their power in terms of the Eastern Mediterranean. Because like you, now you're you're close, you can close off the Dardanelles, and uh, you, there's not this free travel between the Black Sea and uh, the Aegean Sea. Which I guess if the Russians had free movement there, that would be a pretty big deal. But um, Turkey's been a problem all along, right? It was con after the Cuban Missile Crisis. It, it turns out a big motivation for the Soviets in that was because the Americans were keeping nukes in Turkey, which was just too close to the Soviets, 
really, back then bordered the Soviet Union directly in the Caucasus. And so it's just been a constant headache. I think. Yeah, I mean, uh, Turkey, I, I, I can't even remember how many coups it's had, uh, uh, much more than any other European state in the past hundred years, um, which, uh, I mean, uh, the U.S., yeah, it had missiles in, in uh, uh, Turkey that were kind of part of the deal for the Cuban Missile Crisis. But even after that, we still, to this day, we have tactical nuclear weapons stationed at uh a base in Turkey. <laughs> um, and people have questioned the wisdom of that, especially uh, when there was a coup, I think that was in 2016, well, an attempted coup, that one failed. But um, yeah, it, it definitely has a strategic position, especially in regards to then the Soviet Union and now Russia. I mean, it has closed the Dardanelles to any... Um, to the, the inflow of any warships to the Black Sea. Um, so, I mean, it, and <laughs> it also has um, an advanced drone program, which it's been selling to Ukraine. And Turkish drones also played a large role in the war between Armenia and um, Azerbaijan back in 2020, I think it was. So they, they have one of the most substantial non-US militaries in NATO. So they're not um they're not nothing. Well, yeah, some smart person I was reading once said that if Turkey had oil, it would be basically a world power that I mean given its uh given its physical position, the size of its military, uh its neighbors, if it was just if it just had an easy source of cash, yeah. uh <laughs> it would like the saudis right it would be mm -hmm. it would be this continent straddling world power right right between asia and europe and it would be a big important thing that would essentially control the eastern mediterranean uh but as it is they've never really embraced markets they've never really understood that whole western economic thing similar to the russians in many ways mm -hmm. who have had many chances to get rich and squander it each time uh and they're just they're just still economically a backwater. Uh, but how would you describe? You know how when you you witness like a codependent couple or sort of like a borderline abusive relationship, or people who just treat each other badly but claim to love each other or something like that. They, they say they have a complex relationship, right? I, I think a little bit of the relationship between the Russians and the Turks as a complex relationship. It, because it seems that no matter what happens, uh, Moscow's always making overtures to Ankara and they're, they're having negotiations. And I guess Turkey's now attempting to somehow facilitate peace talks, even though that's not going well between the Russians and the Ukrainians. Um, I mean, what, what aspects of, uh, is there reason to believe that Turkey could really be pulled further away from NATO somehow? I mean, I couldn't expect that the Turks would give up that position no matter what, but maybe they, they can be really good at, at playing both sides and getting constant concessions from both the Russians and from NATO countries. I don't know. What do you think of that? Uh, that uh, seems uh, definitely in the realm of possibility, especially in the past few years, Turkey has been more assertive. Um, it's all run together now, so I can't remember if it was in 2020 or 2021. There was a kerfuffle in the eastern uh, Mediterranean over disputed, um, basically, uh, mineral and gas and oil rights uh, out at sea. And uh, the Russians had some kind of like oil exploratory vessel. And uh, I think the French Navy was actually deployed kind of to be like, get out of here. Um, can't remember if it was in Cyprus's territorial waters or I think it was a combination of Greek and Israel and Cypriot claims and things like that. And um, uh, there's just, there has been some writing over the past few years that Turkey's becoming more assertive and that Erdogan has his own kind of a civilizational vision for Turkey. Um, I, I should have looked it up beforehand. I, I'm curious what Turkey's um, birth rate is, if they're above replacement rate. Um, 
which could be quite a long-term advantage for them compared to the rest of Europe. Um, but uh, uh, like Erdogan uh, declared that the Hagia Sophia was no longer going to be a museum, it was going to be a mosque again. Just this kind of idea of we're Turkey, we have this Turkish identity, and uh, we're going to be more assertive. So as the West, um, as like places like France and Germany have come under fire for <laughs> trying to be too conciliatory towards Russia, um, uh, people were attacking Macron uh, for apparently suggesting to Zelensky that Ukraine just needs to make some territorial concessions to the Russians so the war can end and Putin won't lose face. And all these people were angry, like, okay, yeah, what parts of France are we going to give to Russia and things like that? So it's a completely different attitude from what Eastern European countries think about uh, the situation. So it's very possible that, you know, France and Germany will be willing to make deals with Turkey that Eastern European countries might not like and that Western European countries will be more willing to tolerate Turkey <laughs> making deals with Russia as well, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there's not, there's not, I imagine there's no method, certainly nothing that's been tried to expel NATO members. And yeah, not, not that I know of. Um, yeah, I don't think anyone's actually tried to tick, uh, kick Turkey or anyone else out. Not that, not that comes to mind. But the, just the, the very existence and nature of Turkey, I think, calls into question just the whole structure of NATO and how it's grown too large and too diverse. Uh, this has been a discussion, right, among Rothbard and Lou Rockwell has talked a little bit about it at Mises.org, is the issue of uh, these collective security organizations, right? And you can see the benefit of a collective security organization, obviously, right? The U.S. began back in the 1770s is essentially a collective defense organization against mm -hmm. the British. And they tacked a customs union on top of that. Uh, but really, these are supposed to be sovereign countries working together for defense. And I mean, they didn't invent that idea. Um, and so why not have that among Western European countries where they're, they're right next to each other, they have very similar views, uh, maybe even in some cases you could see any sort of group of countries that had maybe all in a language in common should uh, perhaps join together or at least similar languages and so on. But when you start to get really big, as is the, the case with NATO, right, where you've got, so now you've got countries from Latvia to for, to California, right? You got the West, the Western side of North America is in the same defense union as the far eastern reaches of Eastern Europe. In some cases, the Russian border that uh, that 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 seems a little harder to manage. So you've got all these countries with very different geopolitical concerns. And the, the Turkish situation just makes you wonder, and I think Pat Buchanan always just asks these rhetorical questions, right? Will Americans, how many Americans will be required to die for Finland if Finland joins NATO and gets into some sort of uh, conflict with Russia? But of course, one good question has long been, how many Americans will be asked to die for Turkey if Turkey gets into some sort of conflict? And it doesn't have to be just Russia, by the way. Uh, mm -hmm. Article 5 could apply to any country that attacks a NATO country. And I believe that Article 5, the only time it's actually been formally invoked was after 9-11, was when the U.S. the U.S. decided to invoke it and say, hey, we've been attacked, so now all of our NATO members have to help. Yes, that's correct. And on Art Article 5, I have read some takes that, um, <laughs> that it could be uh, understood in a different way <laughs> if, if Turkey actually causes too much trouble. Well, and tell us real quick for the people listening at home what, what Article 5 says. Oh, uh, yeah. So Article 5 is generally, uh, people just think Article 5, it, it's a collective, def uh, collective defense. An attack on one member is an attack on all members of the alliance. Um, and people usually think, oh, automatically every NATO member has to declare war on whoever attacked whoever. Um, but there is wiggle room there. And um, I, I recently looked it up because of um, 
uh, because of the talk of further NATO expansion, uh, there is the legal argument that the being a member of NATO, a uh, signatory of the NATO treaty, does not give the president the unilateral authority to declare war, that the, the, the legislator didn't delegate its power to the president in regards because we join NATO, that technically uh, there'd still have to be a declaration of war from Congress for the U.S. to enter into war. I mean, I doubt that would even happen if Article 5 was invoked. But regarding Turkey, there's just, there's talk that <laughs> that could people might be a little more like oh you know uh, we have the wiggle room to aid Turkey in whatever way we see fit as is within our constitutional processes. Um, so uh, it's possible that Turkey could be well. Uh, I mean, in the long run, that could be good for the U.S no matter how it's <laughs> how that kind of change in the norm could be introduced but um uh short of kicking turkey out i would say that's the most that might be done <laughs> to punish them in going forward well you bring up the issue of offering aid right without actually entering a war and that of course brings us to the ukraine situation uh which raises an important issue in terms of is the United States really required as a part of NATO anymore, right? So of course NATO was found as an anti-Soviet organization, right? And and then you had the Warsaw Pact spring up. And so this idea was you had these two common defense blocks that were going to fight each other if necessary, basically guaranteeing World War III if one Warsaw Pact country got into a conflict with one NATO country. And this, was, of course, was always the problem that uh, people like Lou Rockwell bring up in terms of these big common defense organizations is you could have one country that's out there that has pretty different territorial realities and ideolo ideologies and motivations, and they could go out and actually uh, try and cultivate conflict with another country. And then they end up dragging all these other con countries. And if, if those if those if that first country that that courts conflict ends up doing that with another major power now you've got world war 3 on your hands between this huge nato block and then this other country that really only has a beef with country a that that tried to do the conflict and so you can see now why people then back to what you were just saying that people are now trying to think of well maybe there's maybe there's a way that article 5 doesn't require actually world war 3 by everybody that maybe we just pledge our support and we try and downplay the conflict somehow and that brings us to the ukraine situation right you're looking at ukraine and you're seeing Russia's success there. Now, I do think Russia's doing better than the propaganda says, which is that Russia's decimated and that they'll, they'll soon be completely out of it and they'll have to retreat with their tail between their legs. Uh, I, I have a hard time believing that Russia's ever giving up Mariupol at this point, that I think that's permanently Russian, that uh, the Sea of Azov is Russian territory now, that uh, the water supply for Crimea, which was key in uh, a key part of seizing southern Ukraine, that's going to be seen as non-negotiable. So I don't think Russia's given that stuff up. And I think they'll be able to hold on to it also, especially if they go through with these votes with the locals to decide whether they're going to join Russia or not. But at the same time, it's clear that this idea that we were supposed to believe early on that Russia was going to come in and just occupy the whole country, and then they were going to roll on to Budapest and on to Berlin from there. And people were saying that, right? They were trying to get us to believe not only was the domino theory discredited in the days of the Soviets, but they were trying to get us to believe a new version of it where the Russians were going to roll through Central Europe any day now. Well, that's obviously not going to happen. They obviously have no ability to do that. And... Russia has essentially been fought really quite well by just shipping arms to the Ukrainians. And this has clearly been a problem for them. Uh, enough to drive them completely out of Ukraine? Perhaps not. But they're clearly not a threat to the core of NATO or Central Europe or anything like that. So the question is, if Russia was so easy to really counter by just shipping weapons. And since it's so abundantly clear that Russia does not have any ability to attack any country that's not right on its frontier, 
why does the United States need to be in this alliance to somehow counter Russia? Uh, you've got countries like France, nuclear armed, by the way, UK, nuclear armed. You've got Germany, which could become a nuclear country in a matter of weeks, uh, a huge economy. You take any two of these large European countries and you've got a whole, you've got an economy that rivals that or exceeds that of Russia. And then if you take uh, half of NATO and throw it together, you've got a, a, a economic alliance far, far larger than Russia. So Russia's this small player in terms of its GDP per capita, in terms of its resources, in terms of its military capability, just compared to Russia. You don't need the U.S. in there. So there are people out there saying disband NATO and all that. That's not necessary, right? Just just get the U.S. out of NATO. I mean, do you, what, what do you think? What is the real justification? I mean, obviously, we get why the U.S. wants, why the U.S. regime wants to be in NATO. But from a military standpoint, I mean, can't can't Europe really? They've got lots of wealth and resources. Is is America really necessary to this equation? Looking at this perceived need to counter Russia at every turn. Right. So back, uh, back, back in the good old days <laughs> of the of the Cold War. Uh, the the saying was that uh, NATO's purpose is to keep the Americans in, uh, keep the Soviets out, and to keep the Germans down. Um, so uh, for sure, the U.S. elites want to stay in NATO, uh, and because they get to have a lot of say on uh, <laughs> of what what happens in Western Europe, and also they can drag along European countries into whatever misadventure. <laughs> usually in the Middle East right now, that uh, we get ourselves into. Um, part of the issue is that the European countries have been free-riding <laughs> on the U.S. for so long. Um, in March, kind of right... I can't remember if it was said right before the invasion or right when the invasion started, <laughs> uh, kind of like the head of the German military, the Bundeswehr, or however it's said, it said basically the the German army could not actually contribute to any <laughs> NATO combat operations. It's and <laughs> the the German government is like we're going to double our military spending. We're going to get everything up to shape, and in, in like ten years <laughs> they'll be up to snuff. Basically, <laughs> um, so part of the issue is the Europeans are so used to free riding on the U.S. Um, that to some degree, they, they, they're not really prepared to take care of themselves. Not that I think that's America's problem. <laughs> um, and we see that there is some good developments. Uh, I think it happened right before the invasion or right, right around when it started. Uh, the Polish government announced that they were drastically increasing military spending and that they were going to double the size of their military. And from my perspective, that makes perfect sense as for a country with Poland's history, their kind of terrible uh, geographic <laughs> position, and, uh, you know, right next to Belarus, which is basically, to some extent, a Russian puppet state. Um, so it'd be nice if European countries took steps like that more, but they're not going to as long as the U.S. is there to take care of them. And we can see this in the the great disparity in the flow of military aid to Ukraine. When this $40 billion bill uh, aid package gets passed probably this week, well, when we're recording this, uh, U.S. military aid, I believe, will be about $57 billion. And the war started like three months ago. <laughs> Uh, I think that the military aid Europe has sent to Ukraine is a little over a billion dollars. We we don't live next to Ukraine, uh, you know. Russia is not next door to us. It's it's next door to you, Poland. It's next door to you, Germany. Uh, why are we <laughs> dumping all this money in? Um, so I think it's being, the U.S. being in NATO is a horrible deal for the U.S. It, it's a great deal for U.S. elites who get to you know pester and boss, <laughs> uh, badger Europeans around into doing whatever we want, well, U.S. elites want, but it's a horrible deal for uh, American people who are paying all this money in taxes that is subsidizing wealthy European states um, to no benefit to the American national interest. Our security is not improved 
because we're already so secure, uh, which I think is a key point. Uh, the United States is dominates the Western Hemisphere. There's no rival power in the Western Hemisphere. And to the east, we have the Atlantic Ocean. To the west, we have the Pacific Ocean. And I think people, I don't know if it's from video games or movies or what, but people have forgotten <laughs> that it's, it's a huge undertaking to cross large bodies of water. Just crossing the English Channel for D-Day was a massive, huge undertaking. If China were to try to attack Taiwan, it's about 90 miles away. It, it would be one of the largest undertakings logistically in human history. It's not like Russia or China, which have no distance power projection capabilities, can just sail across the Pacific and attack. <laughs> we're so safe and secure, NATO is a bad deal for us, and it'd be great if we could leave, and maybe in 20 or 30 years we can get there when all the people who think the Cold War is still going on have retired, I guess. But uh, yeah, it, it's a rotten deal. Well, I look forward to the uh, situation improving when I'm 78 years old. It'll, it'll be great. Uh, well, we'll go ahead and wrap up with that for this episode of War, Economy, and State. Thank you, Zachary, for joining me this time. And we will be back in a few weeks for another episode. We'll see you next time.